Capablanca's play in this game is scary. The way he is able to render his, comp his opponent completely helpless. And he does it with zero tactics. Now, I know there are some skeptics out there. You'll say, you think you can find the tactic? We'll see. I think I can make the case there are zero tactics in this game. And also, he plays the move F6 with the black pieces. I'm sure someone out there has said that that's always a blunder. Well, we'll see if it's a blunder when Capablanca does it. His opponent is Carranzo. This was played in a simultaneous exhibition in 2011. Carranzo, Carranza, excuse me, has white. Capablanca has black. Let us jump right in. E4 was played by white. Capablanca plays E5. Knight F3, Knight C6, Knight C3. And Capablanca, maybe because he uh, wanted to keep his opponent out of more theoretical waters, plays the very safe, not fantastic move, d6. But it's, you know, it's a playable move. Bishop to b5 from his opponent, pinning the knight on c6. Not too bad of a threat. But now knight g to e7, he backs up that knight. This is not a great opening from Capablanca, but is that even going to matter? d4 from Carranza, and what does Capablanca do? f6. More orthodox, of course, would be to just take on d4, and after knight d4, a6, bishop e2, take on d4, and knight to c6, and black has a, a fine position here, uh, but Capablanca plays f6, trying to create a, a strong point on e5. Well, let's see how that works out for him. Um, d5, by the way, does not win a piece. Although it was probably white's strongest move, a6 uh, saves the piece for black after bishop e2, knight to b8, a4, but white does have some nice space and play on the queen side here. But instead, he took on e5. Capablanca takes with the f pawn. Again, de5 was a good move, but he takes with the f pawn, creating an asymmetrical structure. He has a half open f file. White has a half open d file. And if you're playing for a win, you want to create asymmetry in the position when you can. Bishop to g5, pinning the knight on e7. Bishop g4, Capablanca pins the knight on f3. Queen to d3. White just steps out of the pin. a6, Capablanca kicks the bishop back to a4. And now h6, asking for a decision from this bishop at g5. And he goes ahead and takes the knight on e7. Uh, that does give Capablanca the bishop pair. And at the moment, after bishop takes e7, the position really is equal. Knight to d5 is played, trying to remove that two bishop advantage from Capablanca. And Capablanca just casually castles. You know, he hasn't really done much. He just moved his pieces, playing safe. Now bishop takes knight. Now this damages black's pawn structure. However, um, there are some issues. First of all, that's about a valuable light squared bishop. Also, after pawn takes bishop, let's say knight takes e7, was playing the game, queen takes e7. Uh, how bad this pawn structure is is actually quite debatable. This pawn structure has some real strengths. You'll notice it controls a lot of central squares here. So while it's technically damaged, uh, it also has some positives. On the other hand, if Capablanca were allowed to take on f3, then the pawn structure damage here would be a serious problem because he could attack it directly down the half-open f-file. So not all pawn structure damage is created equal. White seeing that avoids that by playing knight to d2. He doesn't want that damage on the square f3. Bishop goes back uh, to e6, castles, and now d5, gaining some space uh, for Capablanca. This will be important as the game progresses. So we have the space, pawn structure, and bishop versus knight so far in the position. f3 was played by Carranza, queen to c5 check, king to h1, and a5, gaining more space on the queen side. Now knight to b3, probably a4 would have stopped black from gaining more space, but knight to b3 and queen to b6. Now, white's dream in this position is to exchange off the queens and get a knight on this c5 square. The knight would run rings about around this light squared bishop. So the queen's off, knight on c5, a4, and the knight essentially would be an eternal knight, and it would be probably enough to win the game on its own. So Capablanca can't let that happen, and of course, who would not let that happen. Queen to c3, played by Carranza, trying to control this c5 square, as we just mentioned. But Capablanca plays d4, gaining more space, hitting the queen on c3. The queen moves to c5. So the big mistake here 
would be queen takes c5. That would be an almost losing mistake. After knight takes c5, the knight hits the bishop. He would follow up with a4, and not even the rook. He, he couldn't even play an exchange sacrifice to get rid of the knight because the, the squares adjacent to the knight would be controlled by pawns. So what Capablanca does is he takes the knight first so that he cannot, white cannot get that knight on c5. So queen takes queen, pawn takes queen, and a, b, three. Now, this is very important. Notice the difference in the value of the two pawn majorities. White has a pawn majority on the king side. Capablanca has a pawn majority on the queen side. But white's pawn structure is very rigid, and it will be very slow to advance that pawn majority and create a pass pawn on the king side. Whereas Capablanca's pawn structure is just completely mobile, fluid, and can advance very comfortably on the queen side, along with that space that he has uh, gained. Computers think this is kind of equal, but I, white, black is clearly better here. No question about it. c5, advancing that pawn majority. King to g1, trying to get his king into the game. Capablanca does so also. King f7, king f2, king to e6. And we can also see one of the advantages of having more space for Capablanca is that his king is able to be quite stronger than white's king. Get, it can advance further into the position. King to e2 and b5. and uh, Capablanca continues to advance this mobile queenside majority, king to d2. And here's a very instructive move from Capablanca. He plays g5. So while he also wants to advance his own majority, he also wants to slow down white's majority. He wants to make it harder for white to create a passed pawn on the king's side. Also, at some point, he might even play a minority attack and play on the, the king's side himself in this uh, position. And here, white plays the move h3, which is str strategically not a good move. He is increasing the rigidity of the structure. He's not keeping it fluid. He's making it more rigid. And after h5, he makes a disastrous strategic mistake. He plays the move g4. Now, that's a two-question mark move. And the reason is now he has completely eliminated the flexibility of his majority. He can't even create a pass pawn now after Capablanca plays h4. These pawns are stuck. And there's this weakness at f3 on a half open file. And, but White's kind of done that to himself here. A king to e2. The king has to tend to the uh, f pawn in order to free the f1 rook for activity, not a duty you want the king to be engaged in. Rook to f7. This is flexible. You can either double on the f file or double on the a, a file, either one. Rook to f2. Rook f to a7. Prepare, preparing to break through with a4. Uh, on his, with his majority. King to d3, and now a4 is played. B takes, and here he has an intermediate move. Uh, again, very instructive. c4 check, pushing the king back and creating this very strong structure of pawns, which controls all sorts of squares and really limits white's, uh, white's mobility here. Rook takes a4. Um, he doesn't want to play rook takes a4, rook takes a4 and give Capablanca control of the only open file. Uh, so instead he plays rook to b1, but it doesn't matter. Capablanca is still able to get control of that file by playing rook to a1 after rook f to f1. He exchanges on b1, and now he still has control of the a file, as we can see. Now rook to a2 to target the b2 pawn. King to d1, b4, continuing to push this very strong pawn majority. King to d2. King to d6, getting all of his pieces in their best positions before the final breakthrough. King to d1, king to c5, and here white plays b3, which uh, speeds up black's play a little bit, uh, but that's essentially all it does. c3, and white's threatening to break through with d3, and notice white can't really move anything. The rook can't go to a1, the king can't move to any of these squares, because then c2 would fall. So he is very restricted. Rook to c1. Now here, Capablanca plays d3. Some might say this is a tactic, a breakthrough tactic. Okay, maybe. I'll, <laughs> this would be the only area that you could dispute the zero tactic area uh, uh, claim, in my opinion. But it's, a, it's really it's just so simple. He just moves up and brings his king into the position. There's really nothing more to it. After cd3, he goes ahead and plays rook to h2, attacking the pawn at h3. Rook to c2, and Capablanca could just exchange rooks here. 
And after king takes, king to d4, the king would be forced back, and then Capablanca would just eat the d3 pawn. But instead, he plays rook to h1 check, king to e2, and then king to d4. And notice there's simply nothing white can do. Um, he would be forced to play rook to a2. And in this case, rook to h2, again, someone might say, well, that's a skewer. But let me uh, put a question to that. First of all, white essentially has no choice. It's not like there's a combination here. He, he has been positionally forced to put his pieces in a place where a simple check wins the game. Also, it didn't actually occur. <laughs> in this position, uh, white went ahead and resigned. So really a beautiful positional squeeze from Capablanca with, I say, zero tactics. And he played F6 with black in the opening. What a performance. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us at Chess Dog. See you again soon. Bye.